Maya shifted her gaze to Noelle. Has Noelle seen what Maya was holding? Yes, Noelle was looking right at the baby's face. But really, there was no face to look at. There was a head, yes, but the head was featureless. It looked like an unfinished, see-through doll's head. Struggling to keep her expression composed, Maya started rocking back and forth as if she was holding a real baby. With a quavering voice, she began singing a lullaby. Noelle started talking to Mrs. Carpenter about feeding schedules, and Maya turned away from her friend and her teacher. She surreptitually peeled black back the blanket so she could see the whole of the thing in her arms. No, this wasn't a baby. She didn't know what it was, but it wasn't a baby. Smooth and limp, like a jelly-filled, lifeless rag doll, the floppy content of the baby blanket was an inert mannequin baby, contained in a revolting, slick, translucent skin. <laughs> this isn't even the worst part. <laughs> Beneath the skin, the very faintest outlines of pale blue filaments extended throughout the thing's body. They looked like veins, sort of. Other than these barely perceptible strands, or perceptible strands. The thing's filling was as clear as its outer covering. The summer before Mayo and her friends had visited the Pizzaplex for her AR birthday celebration, Jackson had dragged Noelle and Mayo to a sci-fi movie about cloning. The thing Mayo held reminded her of the unfinished clones. It wasn't an infant. It was like a placeholder for an inf infant. Shall I take her? Mrs. Carpenter said. Mayo whirled around. She tried to find her voice, but she couldn't. She silently nodded and returned the flaccid, what? Being? Creature? Not baby, that was for sure. Maya handed Cecilia to her mother. Can I get you girls a snack? Mrs. Carpenter asked. No, thank you, Maya said, just as Noelle said. Sure. Mrs. Carpenter looked from Maya to Noelle. Maya frowned at her friend. I need to get back home, Maya told Mrs. Carpenter. I have a lot to do. It was sweet of you two to visit. Mrs. Carpenter said. Cecilia likes being the centre of attention. <laughs> oh, I just got chills. I got chills. <laughs> oh, this writing is great. Mrs. Carpenter looked down at Cecilia as if the baby was the cutest thing in the world. Don't you, little one? Mrs. Carpenter nuzzled the baby's smooth, flat, squishy face. Maya felt nauseous. Um, we need to go. Bye, Mrs. Carpenter. Maya grabbed Noelle's hand and pulled her friend out of the teacher's house. In the driveway outside, Maya sucked in the air that smelled of ozone, smelled of me, that doesn't smell great, anyway, and damp earth. The thunderstorm had left as quickly as it had arrived. The ground was soaked, and the sun's warmth was turning the wetness into steam that drifted up from the dirt and pavement like fair ephemeral ghosts. I don't know what that means. Maya leaned over and held her stomach. She felt dizzy and weak. Are you okay? Noelle asked. Maya straightened. She shot Noelle a baffled look. Didn't you see that? See what? Cecilia, she's a cute baby. Noelle studied Maya. What's wrong with you? Maya didn't have time to think much more about Mrs. Carpenter's baby the rest of that day. Well, that wasn't true. Even though she was busy, Maya really couldn't think of anything but Mrs. Carpenter's baby. And Noelle's weird reaction to her. But it creeped Maya out so much she forced herself to focus on something else every time the image of the droopy, dollish infant thing entered her mind. By the end of the day, she'd convinced herself she'd imagine the whole thing. Besides, the news she got over dinner shoved aside everything else. Her mom now had cancer. They gave Maya this news, calmly as Maya's mum dished up beef stew, and her dad handed around the bread basket, a basket that con contained rolls that reminded C Maya of Cecilia's featureless head. Nope. Stop it, she told herself. She was not going to think about that. Maya handed the basket to Elena without taking a roll. Maya wasn't hungry anyway. She picked up a sp her spoon and swirled it in her stew, making circular patterns in the tarragon-scented broth. Her parents were going to die. How could they sit here eating as if everything was okay? Why was Elena chattering about her upcoming college classes? Maya dropped her spoon with a clatter. Elena, stop it! Elena froze with a baby head. No, br bread roll, halfway to her mouth. She lifted her eyebrows. What's your problem? She asked Maya. How are you going to be able to go to school if mom and dad are gone? Maya asked. She looked from Elena to her parents. Maya's dad patted Maya's hand. Oh, don't worry, sweetie. You and Elena will be fine. 
I know it seems like we don't have much, but we've been saving. There's plenty of funds to get you both through school, and this house is paid for. Maya's dad returned to peacefully eating his stew as if he'd just been discussing the day's thunderstorm. This is wonderful, hun, he said to Maya's mum, as usual. Maya's mum smiled. She picked up the bread basket and offered it to Maya. Are you sure we don't... Are you, sorry. Are you sure you don't want to roll, sweetie? Maya erupted from her chair, covered her mouth and ran from the room. She barely made it to the bathroom before she threw up. Did she have cancer now too? No, Maya didn't have cancer. Her mum took her to the hospital the next day. Doctors ran the usual tests. Maya, unlike most of the world's population now, was completely fine. Although fine wasn't the right word to describe Maya at all. There was nothing fine about her. Maya was a wreck. Although school had started again, it wasn't the way Maya had envisioned her senior year. For one thing, most of the regular teachers were dead or dying. Half her, si her, half her class was sick. Maya's favourite activity, choir, was cancelled, as were most extracurricular activities. There weren't enough participants, and even so, no one acted as if anything was wrong. Maya had never liked watching the news. No one in her family did. They preferred talking about happy events and doing fun things than keeping up with what was going on, uh, what was going wrong in the world. But lately, Maya couldn't stop watching the news. She found herself glued to the TV screen whenever she was within range of one. It was like watching a car wreck. It was horrifying, but she couldn't help herself. The news memorized, sorry, the news mesmerized her not because it was all doom and gloom though. In fact, the news was the exact opposite of the panic that would be reasonable in the current situation. Instead of sober reports of illness and death, the newscasts provided sprite, uh, sprightly updates on the number of people diagnosed, being treated and dying. It was like watching a ticker tape of cancer stats, all scrolling across the screen to a backdrop of upbeat instrumental music and the newscasters chirpy narration. I love it so much. Another th 342,128 people died in China yesterday, Bob, a poofy-haired female news anchor announced, as if giving a football score. How are things in Europe? Similar, Pam. The last count was 312,572, Bob responded. Britain has passed a mass cremation law to handle the large numbers of deceased. <laughs> yes, Britain. Go on. <laughs> this is my favourite part of the story. Um, if you don't know, after reading this story, go watch my my uh, if, like my news reports in under construction video because I basically made this into a into a sketch anyway as freaky as these emotionless reports were though they weren't what kept Maya awake at night her eyes weren't glued open in the darkness because of the cancer not even her own sick family kept her awake no what kept her from closing her eyes were the babies or really the not babies she couldn't stop thinking about the unfinished, vaguely baby-shaped things that were now passing for newborns in the world. Mrs. Carpenter Cecilia was the first one that Maya saw, but now she knew that Cecilia wasn't an aberration. All new infants looked like Cecilia. None of the babies were normal. And worse than that, not only were they not born normal, but these new children also weren't growing normally either. A couple days after seeing Cecilia for the first time, Maya had gone to the pharmacy. Skirting around a sidewalk under construction sign, haha, <laughs> Maya had spotted Mrs. Carpenter getting into her car. Hi, Mrs. Carpenter, Maya had called. Hi, Maya. How's Cecilia? Maya had asked, just to be polite. She didn't really want to know anything about the thing Mrs. Carpenter had called her baby. Oh, she's great, Mrs. Carpenter had said, and she gestured toward the passenger seat of her SUV. Looking past Miss Carpenter, Maya had glanced at the bundle she'd expected to see strapped into a baby carrier, but what she saw on the passenger seat wasn't a baby-sized bundle. It was a child-sized... what? Mass? So unstructured that it was a little more than... Well, it was little more than a vaguely human-shaped outline. The thing that Mrs. Carpenter called Cecilia was a drooping pile of gooey material spilling over the edges of the passenger seat. And somehow we have Fazgoo number two, my friends. <laughs> <coughs> Not quite. I think we'd all go insane if it was Fazgu number two. Although this is probably worse than Fazgu. Uh, unmoving, the child thing drooped across the leather lifelessly. But it wasn't lifeless. How could it be? It had more than quadrupled in size in just two days. 
And Mrs. Carpenter clearly didn't think this was strange. She probably didn't think it was strange because these inert mannequin creatures were everywhere now. Maya couldn't go anywhere without seeing one of the nauseating things in some stage of development. By Christmas, Maya's parents were ensconed in hospital beds in the family living room with ivy drips in their arms. They lay with their hands linked, watching old movies while Maya ran around trying to keep up with the care, their care and Elena's care. Elena was sick now too. She was the last of Maya's loved ones to get diagnosed. Sus. <laughs> Elena. Um, Jackson and Noel were dying. All Maya's cousins were dying. Mr. and Mrs. Davis were gone. The twins were on their own, and they were sick and dying. Mrs. Thompson had already died, but Mrs. Thompson was hanging on barely. She was dying, and now her children were sick and dying too. Everyone was dying, and the jelly-filled doll babies were being born right and left, growing. It seemed faster and faster with each pa passing day. Unsettling numbers of them had started showing up in public. They were amassing in parking lots, accumulating on street corners. They didn't move around, they just lay in clumps, like mounds of humanoid-looking debris, stacking up because no one was removing it. Maya couldn't understand why the mounds kept getting big and bigger and bigger. Where were they coming from? A couple days before Christmas, Pastor Ben visited the house. When Maya opened the front door hesitantly, dreading that she'd find one of the new neighbour children, aka doll things, lying on the porch, she was beyond relieved to see her minister smiling at her as if he didn't have a care in the world. Maya threw her arms around the broad-shouldered man with the unruly blonde hair. Pastor Ben, you're still alive. Maya hadn't been to church in months. When was there time for church? Besides, she'd seen on the news that churches had been turned into clinics for the dying. Still kicking, Pastor Ben chuckled. Apparently it's not my time, yet. Maya looked closely at Pastor Ben, and she realised he was sick too. His skin had the same grey pallor she was seeing in everyone she knew and everyone she didn't know. He'd lost a lot of weight since she'd seen him last. He looked like a human hanger for his black shirt and slacks. His white liturgical collar was now two sizes too big for him. Pretending that all was well, Maya opened the door and ushered Pastor Ben into the house. She motioned toward the living room where their parents were weakly but gamely singing, ha singing Christmas carols. Pastor Ben smiled widely as he greeted Maya's mom and dad. What a joyful noise, he exclaimed. As if it was perfectly normal, Pastor Ben grabbed a dining room chair and pulled it up next to Maya's dad's bed. Then he joined in the singing, adding his full baritone to Maya's mom's thready soprano and her dad's raspy tenor. Uh, Pastor Ben motioned to Maya, but she didn't have a single fa la 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 left in her. She gave him a wan smile and said, I've got to... She ran from the room before she could finish. She was in the kitchen making a peanut butter sandwich for Elena when Pastor Ben wandered in a few minutes later. She looked at him and dropped the knife she held. What's going on, Pastor Ben? Why is everyone dying? Pastor Ben lowered himself onto a kitchen chair. It's not for us to ask why. We're given each day to live, not to question. But what about those things everywhere? Maya asked. Ben frowned in confusion. Things? Maya gestured toward the street. The jelly people. Pastor Ben still looked lost. Maya threw up her hands, exasperated. Those things that are like dolls made out of silicone inside plastic wrap. Ben shook his head. The Lord doesn't distinguish life based on its appearance. All life is sacred. <laughs> But those things are lifeless, Maya shouted. They're just... Is that peanut butter? Pastor Ben interrupted. I could use a sandwich. It seems like I never have time to eat. What with all the funerals and baptisms. Maya goggled at her minister. You baptise those things? Pastor Ben smiled. It's part of my job, Maya. Maya shook her head. What more could she say? She felt like she was on a sinking ship and no one but her knew what was going on. No matter how much she ran around trying to sound the alarm, everyone continued to go about their business as if the world was at it should have been. As it should have been, sorry. Sighing, Maya put, her, put the sandwich she'd been making for Elena on her saucer. She handed it to Pastor Ben. She patted her hand in thanks. Lifting the sandwich, Pastor Ben said, The world is a paradox, Maya. A balance of good and bad. People are dying, yes, but life is proliferating. Not only are babies being born at an unprecedented rate, 
but they're also growing into adolescents and then adults in a manner of just days instead of years. Tragedies and miracles tend to go hand in hand. Mayer didn't even try to argue with Pastor Ben about his use of the word babies. He was seeing what he wanted. He was seeing what wasn't there. Or maybe she was the one seeing what wasn't there. Were the jelly beings real? Yes, they had to be. Mayer wasn't imaginative enough to conjure up those horrible things. Over the next several days, Mayer tried to find the ma miracles Pastor Ben had talked about, but it was hopeless. The minister was as delusional as everyone else. One night, late, after Mayer had cleaned up Elena's vomit, emptied her parents' bedpans and sung her mother, whose pain was no longer manageable, to sleep, Mayer went outside to a dormant flower garden. Sitting on the little wooden bench her father had made for her a few years before, she stared at the brittle, bloomless stalks and tried to remember the lively colours that used to fill the yard in the summer. As soon as she tried to picture the flowers, she realised she was having trouble seeing colour at all. Everything was so faded and grey now. The sick and the dying. They were hewless shells. And the new mannequin things? They were sheer vessels, filled with nothing but limpid gel, like human-shaped jellyfish. As she'd done many times since her world had started falling apart, Maya felt for a gold rose. She held it tightly as she leaned back and looked up at the constellations. Although the world beneath them no longer shone brightly, the stars still sparkled in the opaque expanse of the night sky. Oh my god. <laughs> a teardrop actually just left my eye. This is crazy. How, how am I crying about this? Wait. Oh, this is, this is actually, okay, give me one second to have a drink. I don't know how that part was so melancholic for me. I don't know, this is just really good writing. Honestly, it's just really well done, I think. Um, really, Lally's game as a book has really improved from the Fazbear Fright, I think. There's a lot of emotion, uh, and there's a lot of good twists and turns, and I love it. A lot of surprise, that's what I like. She inhaled sharply and sat up straight. The sparkle had triggered a memory, a reminder of the AR unit and the pizza plex. <coughs> that was when it had all started going wrong, wasn't it? Maya put her hand to her temple. The barely perceptible head pain that was a daily companion had begun the morning after she was in the AR booth. But what did that pain have to do with everything else? Maya tried to remember when her gran was first diagnosed with cancer. She couldn't recall how long after her birthday it was when Gran got sick. She probably didn't remember because at the time it wasn't noteworthy. Of course it was upsetting and sad, but it wasn't in any way peculiar. What if? Mayor! A weak voice called out. Mayor let go of the, ro the, go the gold rose pendant, jumped up and dashed into the house. Was that her mum or Elena? She ran first to her mum and found her asleep. She tore down the hall to her bedroom. Elena was reaching for the plastic bin on the nightstand. Maya grabbed it and positioned it under Elena's chin as she held her sister's hair while Elena threw up for the up up umpteenth time that day. Maya chastised herself for taking the time to sit outside. She didn't have the luxury of sitting under the stars and she didn't have time to ask what if. All Maya had time for the next day and the next and the next was running from one sick family member or friend to the other. She no longer bothered to go to school. There were only a few classes available anyway. She wouldn't have left the house at all if she could have helped it. She hated being out in the street. The jelly mannequins were all over now. They seemed to be multiplying faster and faster. They cluttered up the stores and blocked the sidewalks. There were knots of them everywhere that Maya had to go. Um, and how did they get there? And how did they get where they were? Maya had never seen one of the things move. They had limbs, but the limbs didn't seem to work. They could only lie around. They didn't talk either. How could they? They didn't have mouths. They didn't have organs or blood or brains. They weren't human. They were just pretend humans, inexplicably growing objects that never grew into anything that actually functioned. And they didn't just grow, they multiplied on their own. One day, on their way to Jackson's house, Maya nearly crashed her bike when she saw one of the transparent creatures suddenly produce a smaller trans transparent creature. This is horrifying. <laughs> Maya wasn't close enough to the things, thankfully, to see clearly what happened. But it looked like the new lank unlife slipped out of the larger one like an infant coming out the birth canal. 
Well worded. Uh, Maya clapped a hand over her mouth to stifle a scream. How is this possible? The piles of jelly beings were birthing more jelly beings. Don't you think it's bizarre? Maya asked Jackson as she sat next to his bed one afternoon. She was trying to get him to swallow a protein drink. Jackson's parents had died weeks before. So had his older sister. He hadn't let that bother him. I can take care of myself. We're all having to do that now, right? After he'd buried his family, he'd gone on as if everything was hunky-dory. He still read his science and philosophy books. He still danced to music blasting from his boombox. But then he got sick too. He'd gone downhill fast. Jackson sipped. Oh, sorry, Jackson managed to sip of the vanilla protein shake Maya offered him, but he immediately spit it out. The sour vanilla odour made Maya's nose twitch. Maya tried again, but Jackson weakly pushed the bottle away. What's bizarre? he asked. His previously deep voice was barely audible, and it was scratchy, like his vocal cords were caught in brambles. All the... things out there. Maya waved her hand toward the street. As she turned that way, she caught a glimpse of several of the gossamer jelly creatures piled up outside the window. Jackson looked toward the window and shrugged. All experiences are valid, he coughed. Blood stained his lower lip. Jackson, uh, sorry, Maya reached out and wiped Jackson's mouth. She looked at the clock. She had to go home and check on Elena. But what about Jackson? He could no longer take care of himself. Neither could Noelle. Her family was gone too. Maya had been racing from her house to Noelle's to Jackson for, to several of her neighbor's houses for days. Only her parents, her two youngest cousins, and her sister were left in her own family. She'd moved her cousins into her own house so she could watch over them. I have to go, Maya said. I'm not sure my parents are going to last the rest of the day. Maya set the protein drink on Jackson's nightstand. Drink this when you can. It occurred to her that she just talked about her parents' imminent death without crying. She figured her tear drugs had dried up. Oh gosh, I said that wrong. Whatever. You know what I mean. I'll be back in the morning. Maya checked Jackson's IV. She quickly replaced the bags dispensing, uh, the bag dispensing his medication. She might have run out of tears, Maya thought, but she'd gained more nursing skills than she'd ever expected to have. When she'd started caring for all her sick friends and relatives, she could barely handle the cleaning duties without getting sick herself. Now she could wipe up puke and pee and whatever else the body needed to expel without batting an eye. On top of that, she can now give painless shots and easily switch out IV catheters. Uh, Mrs. Thompson had taught her how to do that before the women got so sick she couldn't do anything at all. Maya thought back to when she used to have dreams for her future. Sometimes she thought about being a doctor. Sometimes she thought about being a biologist or a botanist. Now she didn't think about being anything. All she could do was be there for the people she loved. And she needed to move if she was going to be there for everyone left in her care. Maya leaned over and kissed Jackson's forehead. One of his greasy locks brushed against her cheek. Don't worry about me, Jackson rasped. Go take care of your sister. Jackson's eyes fluttered closed. He was asleep. Maya adjusted his covers. Then she left his house. Skirting the jelly people, she cycled back home. By the time Maya returned to her house, she was shocked to find it nearly surrounded by mounds of all of the mannequin things. There were so many of them in the road, on the sidewalks and in the alley behind the house that they seemed to have more like one organism they seemed to be more like one organism instead of several individual sacks of translucent jelly. Maya barely managed to squeeze past a conglomeration of the things to get in her front door. Inside, she slammed the door closed and bolted it. Then she ran to the front window and dropped the blinds. It was only after plunging the room into total darkness that she realised that, that she turned to check on her parents, and she realised she wasn't hearing what she should have been hearing. For the past few days, her parents' breathing had been phlegmy and laboured. They inhaled as if sucking through a straw, and they exhaled in a watery rattle that Maya could barely stand to listen to. The sound of their struggle to get air had been relentless. It had seemed to echo through the house, reaching Maya no matter where she was or what she was doing. But now that sound was gone. Maya switched on a lamp and crossed to her mum's side. Her mum was still, her eyes open and glazed. Maya gently closed her mother's eyes. Shifting her gaze to her dad, Maya saw that his eyes were already closed but he was just as motionless. He was gone too. Maya waited to linger by her parents' side, but she didn't have time. She'd been gone too long. She needed to check her sister and her cousins. I love you, mum and dad, she whispered. Then she ran to her parents' bedroom. 
Maya had put her youngest cousins in her parents' queen-sized bed. She'd surrounded them with pillows so they couldn't fall out of bed. Now she picked up Axel and held him close. His cheeks were no longer pudgy. He hadn't smiled in a long time, but he was still accepting milk or juice from his favourite froggy sippy cup. Maya quickly got the cup and nudged the cup's opening into Axel's slack mouth. As she urged him to drink, she checked on his, his sister, Abril, uh, Abril, or Ab I don't know, that's a weird name to me, sorry. <laughs> Abril, who was five. Abril had always been a tornado of a child, whirling constantly because she loved to dance, or whipping from one activity to the other. She'd never actually been able to stay still, and now Abel barely moved. Her usual perky and shiny pigtails were limp and lusterless. Maya wanted to wash Abel's hair for days, but feeding Abel and her brother and the others Maya had left to care for took precedence. Abel, Nina, 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 uh, Maya said. The little girl's eyes fluttered open. Can you eat something? Continuing to hold the sippy cup for Axel. Maya tried to hand a small container of pudding to Abel. Abel closed her eyes and screwed up her face. She, took, she shook her head. I'm pretty sure I'm not saying this name right. I'm really sorry. I'm just saying Abel now. At the same time, Axel reared back from the sippy cup and threw up all over Maya's chest. Maya quickly settled the boy in the bed and made sure he hadn't aspirated any of the vomit. She cleaned up him up as best as she could and then hurried to the bathroom. Pulling off her shirt, Maya washed herself off. She left the bathroom and headed towards her bedroom. Grabbing a t-shirt from the back of the door, she pulled it on. She made a face when she got a whiff of smet, sweat. Sorry, This shirt wasn't much cleaner than, one she, than the one she'd taken off, but she was out of clean clothes. She hadn't had time to do laundry and she couldn't remember the last time. Elena, lying limply in her bed, moaned. Maya rushed to her side. Checking the IV stand, she saw that Elena's intravenous bag was empty. She was in pain. Maya reached for a new bag. That's when she realised that there wasn't one. She'd forgotten to restock the supplies. She had to go back out. Oh my gosh. <laughs> <coughs> oh. When it had become clear that medical personnel couldn't keep up with all the sick and dying people, the government had set up chemotherapy dispensaries in every town. If you had insurance, you could just pick up the medication and administer it yourself instead of going to the chemo wards if you were well enough to get it. Maya was the only one left in her family in her neighbourhood who was strong enough to go anywhere. The last time she'd been up to the dispensary, she tried to stock up with enough for everyone she was helping. Obviously, she hadn't gotten enough. After giving Elena as much water as she'd accept and trying, unsuccessfully, to give Axel and Abel more food, Maya had grabbed the car keys and headed into the garage. The dispensary was too far away for a bike ride, and besides, the jelly people made bikes, bike rides harrowing. It wasn't that these partially formed humanoid sacks were dangerous. As far as Maya had been able to tell, the empty beings that looked like vaguely human-shaped clear water balloons were benign. They didn't have enough substance to be malevolent. And even if they were, what could they do? They couldn't move. But their existence was enough to creep out Maya. The things, in their very wrongness, sent shivers skittering along Maya's spine. Because they were so unnatural, the dull people unsettled Maya. And if she stopped to think about it, Maya fully expected them to become a threat sooner or later. The sheer volume of them was chilling. How, would, how long would it be before they covered the entire surface of the planet? She made sure she didn't stop to think about that very often. In the garage, Maya started her family's minivan before she hit the garage door opener. If the jelly people weren't headed in the driveway, or sorry, heaped in the driveway, Maya didn't want to risk spilling into the garage before she could get the van going. Maya barely waited for the garage door to clear the top of the van before she put it in reverse and hit the gas. As she'd feared, several of the eerie mannequin things were in the driveway. Well, she'd plow right over them if she needed to. Maya backed hard out of the garage and hit the opener button again. Because her gaze was on the road behind her, Maya wasn't sure if any of the jelly things slopped into her garage. She figured if they did, she'd deal with that later. Once she had the van in the street, it was relatively easy to navigate through the collections of dummy sacks. Besides the mannequin thingies, uh, the streets were mostly empty. Nearly everyone was either sick or at home taking care of the sick. Maya only saw a few cars as she navigated through town. The rest were parked into their driveways or tucked into their garages. Some were in parking lots, but most of the lots were empty. People were dying, but they weren't dropping dead where they stood. 
That was what was weird about everything. It wasn't like a zombie apocalypse, apocalypse or anything. There wasn't a virus or a killing chemical released by a foreign country. It was cancer. And although the disease was killing people quickly, everyone had time to get to a hospital or to their home to die. That was why Mayer's community now looked like a ghost town, quite literally. The dull things, if you ignored their odd jelly consistency and the fact that they didn't go anywhere, were uncannily similar to spectres. But Mayo knew they weren't ghosts. They weren't, well, they weren't anything, actually. They had no heart, no emotion, they had no spirit. They were like globs of nothingness in plastic containers, like human leftovers. When Maya had first seen C Cecilia, the baby's head had reminded Maya of her family's dinner rolls, but now she saw the jelly things as more uncooked dough than a finished product of any kind. They were like batter waiting to go in the oven and get baked. <laughs> Can't wait for myself to get baked. Uh, ne <laughs> nearing the dispensary, Maya's way was blocked by a road under construction sign. She started to make a right turn to, to tour around it, but then she braked and stared at the sign. What was it with all the under construction signs she'd been seeing? Maya frowned, her mind flipping back to other such signs, starting with the one that had been in the front of the AI unit. She tapped her fingers on the steering wheel as she tried to attach meaning to how often she'd seen such signs. Her brain, however, couldn't come up with any coherent ideas about it. Finally, she shrugged and shook her head. She got the car moving again. Maya was able to drive the rest of the way to the dispensary without incident. There, it was a bit more challenging to avoid the aggregations of jelly things to get into the flat-roofed industrial building, but she managed it. There was only one woman left on the duty behind the desk. She didn't appear to be much older than Maya. She might have been a college student before all of this had started, and she'd probably been pretty. Now she was obviously sick herself. Her eyes were sunken, and her complexion was the colour of ash. Brushing a strand of oily brown hair from her face, the woman wiped away at Maya's attempt to fill out the right paperwork. Just take what you need. The woman's voice was barely a whisper, like tissue paper rustling in an air current. Maya didn't argue. She filled the tote bags she'd brought with her with as many intravenous bags of medication she could stuff into them. Then she, sh then she rushed out of the building. In the parking lot, Maya was shocked to see that several piles of jelly people now ringed the outermost rows. Had they been there when she arrived? Had they just not noticed them? Maya didn't stop to consider the question because one large pyramid of the jelly people was now close to the minivan. She ran to the vehicle, threw in the tote bags and slammed the door shut. She had the engine turned over and they ran in gear just as several new jelly beings tumbled off the nearest pile and landed near the front bumper. She backed up fast and tore out of the parking lot. Purposefully, Maya kept her gaze straight ahead. She was not going to look in the rearview mirror to see what was behind her. On the way home, Maya considered stopping by the grocery store. She filled the kitchen with canned soups, cartons of pudding, and bottles of protein drinks, but she figured she should add to what she had. When she got to the store though, the parking lot was nearly buried by the jelly things. They were everywhere, the, like jiggly containerless, containerless gelatin. She couldn't face even trying to make her way through the quivering mass. She headed back to her neighbourhood. Maya's street was thick with the pellucid creatures when she reached it. She gazed down her road to the house. It looked like her driveway had turned into a massive heap of jello. She looked to her right. The van was idling in front of the Thompson's house, and only a few of the mannequin things were lying around the two-story structure. Maya was trying to take care of the last surviving member of the family, Donnie. She figured she might as well leave the car there and run in on to check, to, to check on him. She could hopefully jog home behind the houses, keeping away from as many jelly people as possible. Maya pulled into the Thompson's driveway. She quickly got out of the car, slinging her tote bags of medicine across her body. Running around behind the house, she let herself in the back door, closed it, and locked it behind her. Donnie, it's me, she called out. A weak groan answered her. Maya set the totes on the cluttered kitchen table. She sighed as she glanced around the dirty, neglected room. Gone were the shining surfaces and well-ordered plans, oh, sorry, pans and utensils she was used to seeing in Mr. Mrs. Thompson's domain. The sink was piled with dishes. The granite counters were smeared with stains. Maya didn't want to think about what fluids they were. The room smelled putrid, like spoiled food. Uh, Maya tried to remember sitting in the Thompson's kitchen, eating snickerdoodles and listening to Mr. Thompson bad knock Mr. Thompson's bad knock knock jokes. Maya could almost hear him now. Knock knock. Who's there? C cancer. Cancer who? Cancer see I'm busy? Oh my god! 
<laughs> oh my god. This story gets worse and worse. That's that's a very nice touch in this story. I like that. That's amazing. Uh, that's a very dark joke for a uh, FNAF book, honestly. Jesus, okay. That had been the last joke he'd told her. She'd forced herself to pretend to laugh, and she had cried copiously when he'd pressed an, uh, an envelope full of cash into her hand. Take care of the kids until child services arrive, he'd asked pleadingly. Maya had nodded. She didn't have the heart to tell him that child services couldn't keep up with all the orphaned kids. She'd take care of Donnie, Parker, and Aurora until the end. As she reached into the fridge for a fruit cup now, Maya wondered if the memories of her happy times in this room had really been in this lifetime. It seemed like it happened to another Maya, maybe in one of those parallel realities Jackson used to, to like to talk about. Maya froze with one hand in the fridge. Parallel reality. Was this real? She returned to the what-if question that had been nagging her ever since she looked up the stairs. What if this wasn't real? After all, how could it be real? Everyone dying of cancer. The streets filled with fast-growing jelly beings. What if she was still in the AR booth? If she was, how could she tell? Oh my god. Oh my god. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, she thought back to a big augmented birthday bash. When she'd partied with the crowd of well wishes, or well wishes, sorry, it hadn't felt virtual at all. It had seemed as real as anything else she'd ever experienced. So how did she know whether this was real? That's such an amazing philosophical question. It's probably my favorite philosophical question. Basically, if you're in a simulation, how do you know when you ever escape, right? Especially if the simulation is like perfect to real life. How, how would you know if you've escaped? What are, the, what are the signs that you've left? It's kind of, it's really chilling to think about and that's the whole concept of this story, I think, possibly. I don't know. We'll talk about theories at the end. Well, in a separate video probably, but um, where was I? Maya grabbed a fruit cup and pulled her hand from the fridge. She closed the fridge door with a muted wump. The fridge hummed and Maya remained where she was, mesmerized by the sound until a thud came from the back of the house. Maya jerked her out, herself out of the her air. Eh. Maya jerked herself out of her trance, quickly grabbed a bag of medicine from the tote and trotted out of the kitchen. It had sounded like Donnie had fallen out of bed. She hurried to his room. Sure enough, Donnie was on the floor. What are you doing down there, bud? Maya asked him brightly as if his face wasn't contorted in pain, as if his lips weren't cracked, and as if he wasn't uh, as skeletal as a cadaver. Donnie mumbled something that sounded like brrrr, but she knew he was going to, she was going to try her. He'd dropped Bert, his stuffed alligator. Maya picked up the fallen spittle-encrusted plush toy, then she effortlessly lifted what was left of the rambunctious little boy she used to play hide and seek with. Can you eat some fruit? She asked, holding up the fruit cup. Donnie shook his head. Maya sighed and switched out his intravenous bag. When is this going to end? Come on. She glanced at her watch as she did. She had to go back home. Elena had been without meds for too long, and she had to try and get something in Abril and Axel. On the way, she could check on the Davies twins. Or well, Davis twins. I'm saying all these names like differently now. I don't know why. I am in a different world. Uh, Maya set the fruit cup on Donnie's nightstand. She tucked Bert under the under Donnie's lax arm. I'll be back, kiddo. She told him. He blinked up at her. His eyes shifted as if he was realizing who she was. For a second, his face looked more animated. Weakly, he lifted a hand and pointed across the room. Maya turned and scanned the shelves that hugged the wall opposite Donnie's bed. What was he pointing at? Pfft, Donnie said. Maya glanced at his face. His expression was intense. He was determined that she understood. Maya crossed to the shelves, and she saw it. There was a clumsily wrapped package with her name on it, on the shelf. With a shaking hand, she picked it up. A piece of red folded construction paper was taped to the package. She opened the paper and read, Happy birthday, Maya. She recognised Donnie's large, crooked lettering. Maya looked back at Donnie. He was watching her with more attentiveness than she'd seen in him for days. She returned to his bed and opened the package. Pulling out a vase, a tin can sprayed with gold and decorated with gold-painted rocks, she discovered that her tears hadn't dried up after all. They spilled from her eyes and cascaded down her cheeks as she looked at Donnie's strained but eager face. 
This is beautiful, she exclaimed. Donny blinked. Then he closed his eyes, satisfied. May realised the gift must have been sitting there ever since her 17th non-birthday. He'd probably forgotten about it. Why had he remembered now? Wiping her eyes, Maya leaned over and kissed Donnie's forehead. She held the vase against her heart and she left the room. Back in the kitchen, Maya splashed water on her face. She grabbed her tote bags, tucking the vase in with the medicine. She glanced out the kitchen window and tensed when she saw how many more jelly people were going in the Thompson's front yard. She was going to have to sneak out the back door and go down the alley. She slipped into the utility room off the kitchen and gingerly cracked open the door. Maya exhaled in relief. The Thompson's backyard was empty of the mannequin things. She stepped out of the house and closed and locked the door behind her. Trotting to the back of the property, she eased into the alley. She froze. Here, the way wasn't so clear. The alley was thick with the clear-skinned creatures. There would be no way to avoid them completely. They didn't form a solid mass though. Maya figured she was able to weave her way around them. She took a deep breath and she took off at a fast jog. Six houses stood between the Thompson's house and Maya's home. The first one belonged to Mr. Vance, the mean old man who kicked his dog. Uh... Oh... Uh, no, sorry, I was just thinking of something. Uh, Maya glanced in his back window as she passed it, and she nearly stumbled when she saw him watching her. He was still alive? She thought all the old people were dead. The man was probably too ornery to die, she thought, as she picked up her pace. The Davis twins were two doors down from her. It only took her seconds to get to their back fence. Unfortunately, though, the back of the Davis house was surrounded by the see-through skins. Maya's pace faltered. Should she try it? Studying the creatures around the Davis house, Maya thought she saw a path through them. But then, as she watched, the path disappeared. The things were reproducing faster and faster now, right before Maya's eyes. This was as close as she'd ever been to them while they churned out more of themselves. She could actually see their jug jiggling masses convulsing before ejecting new smaller versions of themselves. They did this over and over. They were spawning. <laughs> <laughs> Slash set world spawn. Uh, no, she couldn't risk going into the Davis house. She needed to get Elena and her cousin sooner rather than later. The twins would have to wait. Maya picked up her pace again. Maya dodged around a horde of jelly creatures. Then she ran full out, uh, sorry, then she ran full out to the back of her house. There she was dismayed to see that her beloved garden was buried in the gelatinous people things. There was barely enough room for her to zip past them and get in the back door. As she passed the last of the creatures before fumbling the door open, she brushed against it. The cold, oily feel of the thing's skin made her shudder. Bile rose up in the back of her throat. She swallowed it down and slammed the back door closed. She bolted it and leaned against its solid wood panels, her chest heaving. For several seconds, Maya couldn't move. Her own limbs felt as insubstantial as those of the things outside her door. A faint cry coming from her parents' room got her going again. I'm coming, she called. She couldn't tell if it was Axel or Abril who had cried out. When she got into the room, she realised it was Abril. Uh, Abril Levine, I'm joking. Uh, <laughs> Axel was unconscious. His little fists curled tightly around the top of the dirty blanket that covered him. Maya cringed at the sight of the filth. She had to find time to wash linens and get everyone cleaned up. Rushing to Abril's side, Maya dropped the totes and picked up the pudding container she'd left for the little girl. It hadn't been open, of course. Abril thrashed in the bed, a painful grimace on her face. Maya grabbed Ab uh, Abril and wrapped her in a hug. I'm here, Nina. I'm here. Abril moaned and cried out again. Maya brushed Abril's wet, matted hair from her clammy forehead. She rocked the child in her arms and started humming a lullaby. Maya wasn't sure how long she hummed and rocked. Quite a while, she decided, when she realised that one of her arms had gone numb from supporting Abril's weight. Maya eased her cousin back onto the bed. Then she looked over at Axel. Axel's fists were no longer clenched. His little hands were slacked. So was his face. He was gone. Maya closed her eyes, waiting for the tears to flow again. They didn't come. Maybe she'd used up her reserves when she'd seen Donnie's gift. Opening her eyes, Maya leaned over and kissed a Axel's already cooling skin. Goodbye, my sweet boy, she whispered. Her spirit as numb as her arm, Maya stood. She turned and left her parents' bedroom. Straightening her shoulders, she headed down the hall to check on Elena. Would she be gone too? Would it be so bad if she was? Just outside her doorway, Maya sank to the floor. She closed her eyes and let her head fall back against the wall with a thunk. She barely felt the impact. She couldn't do it anymore. Who was she kidding? 
There was no way she could keep up with trying to feed and medicate for the people that were left for her to care for. What was the point? Everyone was going to die. Everyone but Maya. Maya opened her eyes. Why wasn't she getting sick? Why did it seem to be happening to everyone around her? It was as if she was at the focal point of everything. Just like she had been at her big per birthday party. Maybe she was still in the AI unit. Maya touched her forehead where the faint pain was still discernible. She'd been far too busy to pay attention to it, but it was there. Was it there because the headband was still in place? Maya shook her head. No, this was all just too intense to be some to be part of some kind of computer generated scenario. But why was it happening? Had the AR booth somehow augmented the whole world? Or had she jumped into a parallel universe? Maya sighed. She didn't know enough to answer these questions. Probably no one did. Maya stood. She had to stop feeling sorry for herself. And she still needed to check on Elena. Even if Elena was going to die, she deserved as much comfort as Maya could offer until then. Maya glanced at the bedroom window as she crossed to Elena's bed and she wished she hadn't. Just in the time she'd spent in the hallway, the jelly beings outside her house had multiplied alarmingly. A mountain of them was pressing against the house, as if trying to merge with the dwelling. Maya stared at the fragile glass covering the window. Maybe the threat she'd find sliding along with the jelly creatures had finally arrived. But what she could what bleh, but what could she do about it? Maya decided to play ostrich. Out of out of sight, out of mind. She turned her back to the window and went to her sister's side. Elena was so still that Maya thought she was gone. She felt her sister's fragile wrist. No, Ellen, Elena was a alive. Barely. A faint pulse fluttered against her thin skin. Without looking at the window, Maya reached into one of the tote bags and pulled out a bag of medicine. She hooked it up and checked the rate of the drip. She wasn't sure why she was bothering. Elena was obviously unconscious and would probably pass away without waking up. But Maya needed to feel like she was doing something. Maya was starting to lie down on the bed next to her sister when the window behind her shattered. Maya spun around as a series of loud cracks and clatters sounded throughout the house. Maya screamed. The jelly beings were no longer pressing against the house. They were pouring into the house through the broken windows, sloshing through the jagged opening like a transparent octopus with an infinite lumber of legs. The aggregation of vicious humanoids was more liquid than solid. They flowed into the room as if they were a ghastly jellyfish-filled tsunami surging up onto the beach. This is an amazing paragraph. Oh my gosh. Maya whirled toward Eleanor. I keep saying Eleanor. Elena. She bent over to lift her sister, but she realised immediately that Elena was no longer breathing. Her hardly there pulse was gone. Maya didn't want to leave her sister's body in the room, but when something slick started to encircle Maya's ankle, she couldn't think anymore. All she could do was react. She turned and ran from the room. Barreling down the hall, Maya careened around the corner toward the kitchen. She didn't have a solid plan in her head, but some part of her mind thought that if she could get to the garage, she'd be safe. The garage had no windows, and both the garage door and the main door were thick and strong. How long could she hold out in there? She didn't think that far ahead. All she wanted to do now was get away from the squishy mass of gel humanoids. She'd always thought that things were mindless, but now she wondered, did they, had in did they have intention? If they did, what did they want? Maya glanced into the kitchen. She gasped. The kitchen was filled with the creatures. She looked to her left. So was the living room. All the windows in the house were shattered. The front door had been smashed open. The doll things were tumbling toward her from all directions. Even though each individual jelly thing didn't take action on its own, except to push out more jelly things, the congregation of them created movement. They were, they were like specks of dirt. One of them might be harmless, but combined together they had enough weight and force to bury her if they cascaded over her. If the things did have an intention, it was a communal one, and it didn't appear to be a good one. They were slowly but surely surrounding her. Maya lunged for the door leading out to the garage. She flung it open and leaped into the darkness before slamming the door behind her. Instantly, she realised her mistake. When she left the house earlier, she hadn't closed the garage door fast enough. Some of the creatures had obviously fallen in before the door had come down. Maya was overtaken by a squishy, cold, slimy mass. The sensation was disgusting. It felt like she'd been thrown... It felt like she'd thrown herself into a bowl of sticky rice noodles. The jelly beings filled the garage, and now they incorpor incorporated Maya as if she was an essential missing part of their collective. They entwined around her, merging with her, smothering her. Seeking comfort and strength, Maya groped for her gold rose. When she found it, she clenched her fist around it, trying to fill herself with the love it represented. If only it was a magic rose, like Ruby Shoes, that could transport her back to 
Maya's mouth and nose filled with the malleable mush of the creatures that embraced her. She struggled to get air, expecting each breath to be her last. But her last breath didn't come. The spongy, ever-expanding weight burgeoned, bur burgeoned above her, and it felt like her body wouldn't be able to take the pressure any longer. But it did. Maya couldn't see anything. She couldn't hear or smell anything. She'd gone beyond feeling too. All she was aware of was the force above her, and even that was becoming too much for her mind to comprehend. Why wasn't she dead yet? When would this be over? Maya tried to inhale and couldn't. Hopefully this would end soon. Or would it? <laughs> yes! We finished on the construction. Oh my god. Oh my god. <laughs> that story is fantastical in so many different ways. Uh, I'm, I, I could talk for hours about this, so I'm going to keep it short. But real quick, uh, the only big problem I have with this story is the mention of the, the word cancer. Uh, they should have used a, like a, a fake disease, like a made up disease instead of a real life disease that actually affects people. Um, so, like, I, I really, I respect, like, the real Jake had cancer in it, the frailty had cancer in it, but they were more sentimental stories, especially when they were touching on the cancer parts. This was more kind of comedic to me, uh, and very surreal, and I feel like the disease should have been surreal as well. But, uh, either way, amazing. I had so many emotions reading this story, like, I read the summaries for this story, and... Even still reading this, I felt chills and I felt um, uh, emotion, even though I knew what, it would hap what was happening. So really, this story is amazing. I know a lot of people don't like it because it's so surreal. To that, I say, that's the point. Uh, yes, she is in a simulation. Yes, she died in the AR game or whatever, and her soul is now in the AR thing. Yes, it is a parallel to Princess Quest. I have a lot of things I can talk about, but it's going to be in my explained video, which is going to be out very soon. Uh, anyway, hopefully you enjoyed. Let me know all of your thoughts in the comments below. Thank you for listening and reading with me, and uh, I will see you later. Goodbye.